the five storylines interweave and you can go back and see things you didn't notice before. It's, it's kind of a lot of fun. And then we have this strange creature called Sam who's punishing people for failing to uphold the tradition. Nowadays, no one really cares. That's the fear it's kind of playing on. I think there's something all humankind feels at the core of our being, that there is right and wrong, and an undercurrent of dread then, that if we break that, there will be comeuppance, if not from man, then something from beyond. I call it pumpkin pulp fiction. Uh, <laughs> see, see what I did there. James Harleman, welcome to the channel. Happy to be here. Great to have you. So you're a Christian pastor and you're author of the book Cinemagogue, which I have here, which has been very formative in, in my own journey of kind of looking at film from a deeper perspective, getting into the theology of, of film you. and that kind of thing. And you're a co-host on the Popcorn Theology podcast, which yep. is uh, one of my absolute favorite podcasts. Uh, <laughs> we have a mutual friend, Rory, who, who introduced me to it and, and yeah. your work. So uh, I wanted to get you on for, for a conversation about uh, Michael Doherty's Trick or Treat. You watch this film every year is that right it's true I, I you know give or take maybe a year where something's crazy and we don't get to squeeze it in but well i suppose someone could accuse me of having probably my wife and i of having a uh, a dark sense of humor so maybe warped sense of humor but uh, I, I really do think i like michael dougherty he seems like someone who loves his craft and usually loves the subject matter that he works with there's lots of nods to horror movies throughout this movie and even even the way that the five storylines interweave and you can go back and see characters leaving at times others are passing and things you didn't notice before it's it's kind of a lot of fun i grew up watching a lot of anthology story type of uh you know, tv like tales from the crypt or the twilight zone and so that that kind of anthology story uh, usually with some uh, a bit of a, a dark or cautionary tale aspect to it. It's just something I grew up in with childhood. And so uh, this kind of encapsulates a lot of those elements that, that I do like when it comes to scary movies, if you will. Yeah, and you mentioned this nonlinear narrative. It's, it's kind of like Pulp Fiction, I guess. Uh, I, I call it yeah. Pumpkin Pulp Fiction. <laughs> <laughs> uh, see what I did there. For anyone watching, if it's been a while since you've seen the film, it might be helpful to just get the lay of the land and ju just go through a, a brief summary of each of those five storylines that you mentioned. Sure. Uh, so we will be getting straight into spoilers uh, for anyone anyone watching. So it's Halloween night in Warren Valley, Ohio, a fictional setting. So James, can you kick us off with part one? Yeah, part one, the film opens with a married couple, Henry and Emma. Henry is a stickler for the rules of Halloween, and he warns his wife, Emma, not to extinguish the jack-o'-lantern before midnight. She ignores that advice and is summarily and brutally murdered. Part two, we then go to the house of school principal Stephen Wilkins, who is teaching a rebellious young candy thief named Charlie about the importance of honoring Halloween traditions. Wilkins poisons Charlie and attempts to bury him in his back garden before carving his severed head with the help of his own son, Billy. That one gets dark very quickly, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Part three, a girl named Macy tells her friends about the urban legend of the Halloween high school bus massacre. As the story goes, the parents of eight troubled kids bribed the bus driver to kill them. But instead, a child manages to gain control of the bus only to send it over the edge of a cliff. The kids drowned, but the driver survived. After telling this story, Macy and her friends perform a prank on Rhonda, pretending to be the bus kids back from the dead. But then the actual ghosts of the bus kids rise up from the lake, and in revenge for the prank, Rhonda abandons Macy and her friends to their grisly deaths. Part four, Lori and her friends are getting ready for a party in the woods. Lori is being peer pressured into finding a date. She stays behind at the town festival, and then on the way to the woods, she is attacked by Principal Stephen Wilkins, again, this time disguised as a vampire. But then it is revealed that Laurie and her friends are werewolves, and Stephen becomes Laurie's first kill. Part 5, we go to Krieg, the neighbor of Stephen Wilkins. He despises Halloween and tries to isolate himself from all of the trick-or-treating. But then he's attacked by Sam, a bizarre creature who appears throughout the film. Eventually, Sam spares Krieg and crosses the road to punish Emma for extinguishing that jack-o'-lantern. Thus, the movie ends where it begins. We discover that Krieg is, in fact, the bus driver from the Halloween High School bus massacre. And the ghosts of the kids show up to kill him in revenge. 
yeah, if we jump in with the deeper themes then, so so I think a key one is this idea of tradition and honouring tradition, Halloween traditions. Warren Valley, Ohio, where the holiday and all of its strange traditions are taken very seriously. Danielle, I look like I'm five. Shut up, you, you look great. <laughs> it's tradition. Great. What does tradition say we do now? We meet our dates. And so we encounter all sorts of, of traditions. Don't extinguish your jack-o'-lantern before midnight. Don't destroy jack-o'-lanterns. Don't steal candy. Provide candy for any trick-or-treaters who come to your door. Wear costumes. And then we have this strange creature called Sam who's punishing people for failing to uphold the traditions or being flippant about the traditions. So what what's going on there? What, what do you think, James, the film is tapping into with this kind of obsession about tradition? <sighs> Well, well, we're talking about traditions, of course, and I think at one point Wilkins even calls them rules. He's like, these are rules. And when you kind of think about it, it's don't steal as applied to candy, offer hospitality to strangers. You could liken some of these to commandments that well, we find in other places as well in terms of even God and his people in the scriptures. And I think, I think it's tapping into this idea that there are, there are immutable laws that once trespassed bring judgment. Like that's the fear it's kind of playing on it's not it's obviously halloween specific but i think there's something all humankind feels at, at the core of our being that there is right and wrong particularly there are wrongs and an undercurrent of dread then that if if we trespass if we break that there will be comeuppance if not from man then something from beyond and, and i think christians know this to be true right jesus says don't fear those who can kill the body but fear the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell and of course, this isn't dealt with by a Sam or by werewolves, but actually we see in scripture, sometimes it's God himself. We see it in the Bible, God's relationship with his chosen people. He covenants with them in the Old Testament. He gives them laws and commandments. And if his people didn't keep them, there were consequences, sometimes severe, right? They, they, and they weren't just moral, but also ceremonial traditions like feast days and the Passover. In fact, in one case, Moses didn't circumcise his children and God himself shows up ready to deal a deadly judgment. And it's actually Moses' wife who intercedes and stays God's hand, not not unlike a piece of candy coming between Krieg and the killing blow of Sam in this movie. That was the part of Exodus that we often uh, miss out in our <laughs> kind of <laughs> yeah. sc uh, storybook Bibles, isn't it? <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Well, at other times, God brings discipline on the whole nation for their corporate failure to follow the rules they've been given. And of course, this goes all the way back to the garden and a first trespass that brought about the fall. And so I, without the gospel... Like outside of the covenant of grace through Jesus Christ, there's a very real dread, I think movies like this tap into, that our sins will be brought to light. Metaphorical, at least hopefully metaphorical bodies in our backyards will be discovered. And the ways we've hurt others will be brought back kind of tenfold upon ourselves, like what happens to the misbehaving children who terrorize Rhonda. Right. So it's a very very rules-based system that we see in this film i guess yeah. as you're saying not not a lot of grace no uh, <laughs> any grace i'm not i'm thinking i'm trying to think of any grace in this movie <laughs> yeah um maybe we could actually watch that clip you mentioned of uh mm. wilkins uh talking about honoring the traditions uh, smashing jack-o'-lanterns stealing candy it's okay believe it or not i was just like you when i was a kid and my dad sent me straight, that is. See, my dad taught me tonight is about respecting the dead. Because this is the one night that the dead and all sorts of other things roam free <laughs> and pay us a visit. Sorry. All these traditions, jack-o'-lanterns, putting on costumes, handing out treats, they were started to protect us, but nowadays, no one really cares. Yeah, so I think that's quite interesting in what you were saying in terms of these traditions were started to protect us and this sense that uh is it was it G.K. Chesterton who said if uh don't don't tear down a fence if you don't know what it's there for. Mm. Um and this idea that sometimes when lots of time passes and we see this in scripture 
honoring traditions becomes something that starts to fall by the wayside it's almost uh, a sense of are we really still doing this or maybe it wasn't passed on properly from generation to generation and so you get like the children of of eli messing around at the start of one samuel oh, yeah. um and yeah th- just this sense that tradition is designed to protect us they're there for a good reason but we see kids in this film who i guess just aren't taking that seriously what what, what do you think of that yeah or, or adults, right? And Mr. Krieg as well. It can, yeah. it can be lost between <laughs> generations, but then some jaded folks can raise up that next generation as well. And I think that's it's sort of interesting to see a variety of peoples in this film at various stages of life who have uh, sort of forsaken the tradition or, or sort of what's obviously the big deal within the confines of this narrative. And, it, you know, I mean, some people would look at you know, some, some collapse of... Uh, of uh, Western Western civilization right now is kind of undergoing some strange things where a lot of traditions or a lot of, uh, of normal values of previous generations are falling by the wayside and and it's creating a lot of conversation and chaos and flux and and some of some of that sometimes uh, there's a downside to moralism and it has its own negatives if we don't understand really what what the commands and obedience are, are truly all about. Uh, but at the same time, when those things are out of place, sometimes we do wind up with more chaos and and more problems. And there's there's a depth that this movie doesn't explore in terms of of really what what having sort of a, a set of rules and traditions ought to be about. We never get there in this film, but that's that's where it opens up some doorways to conversation. And we do meet a few people in the film who are who are, who are very zealous for the for the laws and traditions, I suppose. So one of them is is Rhonda. Yeah. And I've got another clip here of her talking. You must really like Halloween. You mean Sawin? What? Sawin, also known as All Hallows Eve, also known as Halloween. Predating Christianity, the Celtic holiday was celebrated on the one night between autumn and winter when the barrier between the living and the dead was thinnest and often involved rituals that included human sacrifice. That's interesting, isn't it? So she's talking about observing the Halloween rules and participating in this kind of ancient paganism. And it's interesting that she makes a point of saying it predates Christianity. Mm -hmm. Why do you think she's drawing attention to that? Maybe... It's an insignificant detail, but I don't know. No, I I think this turns up uh, in a several scary movies that I've I've seen, uh, you know, so different horror elements, and I think usually it's to stir some fear around the idea of something ancient, mysterious, and older in the hearts of viewers, really more than anything else. Uh, uh, many of whom I'm gonna I'm gonna suspect probably think the Christian faith is something that emerged two thousand years ago, uh, which which is true but isn't true. Uh, so I think the appeal here is that it's tying us back, it's seeking to tie us back to something even more ancient and perhaps more formative to human experience. And and certainly many pagan religions and transition and, and traditions predate the term for the biblical God followers after Christ came. But but I think what what's forgotten there is that Christ himself claimed before Abraham, I am, and pointed to the Old Testament as true, revealing the true God and which means then that the roots of Christian faith go back thousands of years to this ancient thing that she's appealing to. It's like we, you know, we even see in Revelation one, uh, Christ is described as the ancient of days. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, and its wheels were burning fire. And and I think uh, it's that ancient judge, but that ancient judge is Jesus Himself. And so I. I what she's trying to get get back is something beyond the incarnation of Christ to something scarier. And I think when we think about outside of what Christ came and offered through his incarnation, uh, scripture says it's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God outside of right relationship. And so I, I, I think that's thematically, I think she's appealing to pagan traditions. But what, she, what we're really trying to get back to is this the terror that exists outside of what Christ offered 2000 was revealed in Christ 2000 years ago. I hear this sometimes that older is kind of truer and more more fundamental. You yeah, know, the further back you can go, if we could find a tradition that was like from the first 
human ever or whatever then that would be more likely to be true but of course in a sense we kind of agree with that because if christianity is true then it's before all things we have the father loving the son in the joy of the spirit and you know the entire judeo christian tradition knowing the living god from the dawn of humanity so it's just uh, yeah as you say she kind of assumes that christianity is as old as the term (laughs) And, and in a sense, p- pagan religion begins to emerge with distortions, probably from Cain, biblically, right? So uh, there's uh, Cain goes out. So like they emerge very early. So they certainly are ancient. Ancient distorted worship of not God has been around since the earliest of days, but but not the first and foremost. So I was actually doing a I was prepping for a sermon last week and. And one of the terms that gets used if you translate it from the Hebrew to describe God is aforetime, which is which is just he is he is preceding, he is presiding, and he is everlasting. And that's that's the most you don't get more ancient than that. So <laughs> Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, so let's talk about Sam, who's this uh bizarre recurring figure who enforces the rules of Halloween. And we don't know much about him or or his origins, but he he wears this kind of orange pajama onesie. <laughs> You've got one on your on your desk. I can see that. Yeah. Um, and he has this kind of spherical mask of sackcloth with button eyes. When we do see him unmasked briefly, his face is kind of a cross between a jack o' lantern and a skull. And if I'm right, when he when he kind of gets stabbed, it's almost like pumpkin pulp that comes out. It's like he's actually made of pumpkin <laughs> and seeds i think um, too pumpkin seeds yeah oh really yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so what do you make of uh, of sam and the role he plays in the story well other than being kind of cute in a horrible kind of way uh <laughs> at, at least until the at least until the uh sackcloth comes off it's funny you mention sackcloth first i, I think i've always ref- thought of it in terms of just burlap but when you actually think about it, if he's wearing sackcloth over his face that's would actually be almost a sign of mourning Almost as if it's a lament that the rules are being broken, and where's this mask? And of course, that it's an interesting. Uh, there might be something more interesting to explore there, but I think on a surface level, it's easy to see him as a demonic figure, uh, bringing torment. But I think in the fictional confines of this movie's reality, if you will, he's he's bringing judgment on rule breakers. He's, he's bringing justice in some ways. He seems to be at times the hands-on agent, policing agent of the rules, but sometimes he just acts in the film like a presiding agent. Like he, it's like he's standing in approval as lesser figures like the school bus spirits or the werewolves meet out that judgment on the wicked and the rule breakers. So he, in a weird way, and I always want to be careful here, he's a very small stand-in for, for God, a little g-god to be obvious, not even close, but kind of mimicking the God that we see in the Bible who does bring judgment for trespass. And and like Sam in this movie, sometimes God in a very direct way does that. But also sometimes he also is just a presiding figure over that judgment in terms of neighboring nations or other forces used to carry out a needed correction. And and so it's, it sounds almost blasphemous to compare him to God, but that's the kind of an agent of judgment at the very least is, is what's kind of being symbolized here. Yeah, that's fascinating. And the sense that he's kind of always there. He mm. comes to the, the doorstep of Stephen Wilkins kind of posing as a trick-or-treater. And when Rhonda comes out after mm-hmm. leading the kids to their, their deaths and she just kind of exchanges a nod with him. Yeah, and And then at the end with Krieg, he kind of... Yeah, he doesn't kill Creek. He spares him, and there's a sense of almost handing him over to the bus uh, spirits yeah. that, that have sort of come back to to haunt him from all those years ago. So he he kind of he kind of atones for his lack of hospitality with with the inadvertent candy that that drops between him. So it's like it's like okay, you were spared for that one, uh, but you've still got these other uh, past sins weighing you down. Like there, there's no. There's there's no substitute or atonement for those, so except for this death. And so there's there's a strange playing of it. It's that it's that how how can how can the wrath be satiated? It's and and in this case we don't really see that it ever is effective for for anyone, except for the seemingly like kind of the ones that have kept the rules like Rhonda or, or Emma's husband. Uh, although Emma's husband is is a pretty deplorable guy too. 
Yeah, absolutely. In your book, Cinema Gog, which I've, I've got here, um, <laughs> you talk about films as being either kind of life under the sun films or life transcendent films. Hmm. Could you unpack for anyone who hasn't read the book what those two categories are and what you think Trick or Treat would kind of fall into? Yeah, well... The famous author Kurt Vonnegut once said, and I think he said it sarcastically, but he said that there was only one story, one, one plot, and he, he described it as, quote, man in a hole. <laughs> in other words, what makes a narrative interesting is conflict or having a problem to solve. Your protagonist, your protagonist is literally or metaphorically in a hole. That could be a, a conflict of identity or circumstance or, or like characters in this film, a consequence of rule breaking. And I think from there that the narrative atom gets split as to whether or not the character can get out of the hole or or whether he's stuck in the hole. Or in other words, is it a meaningless life under the sun that a character simply has to come to terms with? Or is there hope for some kind of transformation or a salvation or some kind of transcendence in some narrative form? Right? So the one story is about a character usually ending up either in anguish or acceptance over their lot like citizen kane's a good example shakespeare's hamlet obviously everybody's dead uh spoilers on that one uh whereas, whereas spo you know, stories like iron man or superman give us images of transcendence either either of a transformed life or heart or a, a figure of transforming savior or, or sometimes a mixture of both like we get in the matrix a convert and or a christ figure and you might even liken it to one's an atheist narrative all there is is life under the sun. And the other is a distinctly more religious narrative that there's some kind of hope for transcendence. I, I kind of feel like these are your north and south poles of storytelling and every story falls somewhere in between. And so I guess with Trick or Treat, there's definitely a, a supernatural element, <laughs> but there's not a sense that people could get anything better than avoiding judgment, basically. As, as long as you honor the, the rules of, of Halloween, you might be okay, um, but it doesn't really get any better than that, would you say? <laughs> yeah, this is a curious one to sort of categorize or quantify according to my own rules right there, because some films, and maybe they're the most interesting films, are the ones that I, I find curious. They teeter on a tightrope somewhere in between. Uh, like the end of 2008's The Dark Knight, it's a good example. We see Batman taking on the sins of Harvey Dent and that could be likened to Christ becoming a scapegoat to redeem. But, but when he, what he and Commissioner Gordon actually offer as hope for the people, it's also predicated on falsehood. So it could be suggesting hope is just an opiate for the masses. So it, uh, was it life under the sun story? Is it a life transcendent story? Kind of hard to figure out. And Trick or Treat walks that, that similar tightrope. Uh, on the one hand, there's truly agents at work that transcend the material world. So it's not an atheist story. There's obviously more at play than life under the sun. But, but we never really see any character transcend their fate. Most characters seem cursed, stuck under some kind of law and, and comeuppance they get with no salvation. Or, and even Krieg is spared by Sam, as we mentioned, but the stay of execution is temporary. And, and even someone like Rhonda, she's smart enough to be spared the death that her peers suffer, but saved to, to what, right? It seems like we just she's saved to have another day in life under the sun. So it's like, all we have here in this story is life under the sun, and even deeper under with hell and damnation. That, that, so I, I, would, I would say it falls largely into more of the hopeless or the meaningless chaotic category because uh, there's no, there doesn't seem to be any transcendent gains from law keeping. Uh, and this, so this is a narrative in desperate need of the gospel. Yeah, totally. That's really helpful. So an, another key theme I was thinking about was deception. We see a lot of deception in the film. Yeah. So people are not what they seem at first. So the school principal, Stephen Wilkins, you think he's kind of t chatting to this kid to kind of inspire him to be a, a better guy, but he's actually a murderer yeah. and he's poisoned the chocolate that, that he's eating. Later in the film, he disguises himself in a vampire costume. Uh, the young ladies that we meet, turn out to be werewolves yeah. and that, that's that's quite funny isn't it because they're always talking about you know it's her first night and you think it's going to be about about sex yeah. and partying and that kind of thing but it turns out no it's her first night uh killing uh, yeah. as a werewolf i guess um and it's interesting that her name is laurie as well i was wondering if that was a halloween reference yes. the, yeah, yeah. the kind of final girl kind of figure yeah and and then Sam himself, at first we think he's just another kid 
another trick or treater, but he's kind of this undercover figure. Yeah. Uh, so m- maybe that's not that one might not necessarily be seen as deception, more a, a kind of a disguise, I suppose. But mm. but we do see a lot of deception in the film, a lot of these kind of false coverings. Yeah. So could you unpack what's going on there from a, a theological perspective? Well, yeah, theologically thinking that through, uh, Halloween is kind of a great metaphor in many ways because in real life uh, all the other days of the year most of us at some point sometime or another we we all wear masks we we want to be seen in a certain light we want our social media profiles are a great example they caref- you know our carefully curated life moments with selfies that project a specific demeanor uh, this we, jesus called out these things with the teachers of the law and scripture i think and i think his call out in Matthew 23 kind of pairs nicely with Principal Wilkins, who's maybe not a teacher in role, but he's there. He's part of the head of a school. Uh, Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs, which appear beautiful on the outside, but inside are full of the bones of the dead and every kind of impurity. In the same way, on the outside, you seem righteous to people, but inside you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. And here you have this this veneer that he wears, which is clearly, uh, he's, he's a principal, should be helping shepherd kids, and here he's killing some of them in some pretty heinous ways, as well as adults. And it goes right back to Genesis, doesn't it, with Adam and Eve making the, the fig leaf coverings mm. to cover their their shame, and uh, and fascinating that, that Jesus curses the fig tree, and it's almost like he's He's peeling back the, the fig leaf uh, layers mm. um, to, to get yeah. to the truth. And, and Rhonda, too, we see she takes the kids at, at face value. She takes them for who they seem to be on the outside, very trusting, and winds up then being on the receiving end of, of that terrible prank. And there, there's a classic moment in Scripture where God tells his prophet Samuel, right, not to look on someone's outward appearance or stature. And he says, for the Lord sees not as man sees, Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And so I, we might say there's varying weights of deception in the film. We would probably rank Wilkins' deception as far more deadly and mean-spirited than, he, than the kids playing a, a, a mean, bullying prank. But ultimately, it's interesting. We see the hypocrisy and the lawlessness held to account, and the wages for all of them seem to warrant death, just from, from a blown-out candle to a full-blown murder. And... So it's fascinating because scripture, theologically, scripture says one day all the masks will be pulled off, right? All the things will be exposed to the light of of judgment. And again, outside of the saving power of the gospel of grace, that's scarier than any horror movie. Yeah. And I've just realized actually, yeah, the the high school bus massacre, that is a a very egregious deception, Mm. isn't it? To to just put these kids on a a school bus and they, they think they're... They're just doing their usual journey, yeah. but it, the parents have all conspired to this is actually leading them to their deaths. Yeah, that one young boy was very right when he kept saying, wrong way. <laughs> wrong way in so many ways. <laughs> Are there any other sort of major themes in the film that we've maybe not covered so far or anything else that you'd want to draw out? Well, I think the closest that we get to to any kind of of transformation is... Is is obviously the transformation of Lori, and and that's where we have it, that's the the classic narrative of com, sort of a coming of age moment, if you will, in a bizarre kind of way, and and again when you see then who she's able to uh, take out, it's like well these these characters are not in and of themselves very virtuous, and obviously represent some pretty pretty dark figures in and of themselves, but. Again, I think you, you see that they are, uh, it's, you have somebody coming into, I, we're supposed to kind of be rooting for her at the end, that she's able to come into her own and stand up against all of these creeps. And, and even some of the other, like that the hot dog guy was there. Um, all, all, none of these people that they were also uh, executing judgment on were, or just enjoying for dinner were, were seemingly virtuous in any way. And so I, I, I think we're supposed to take a little bit of yeah satisfaction there but that to me feels a little bit more like the the book of judges where okay the, this isn't this isn't the hero and the villain this is just people at cross purposes all doing what's as judges says was right in their own eyes and just still part of the mess and miasma of of the world and 
And so I, that'd be the one thing where it's like, wait, I don't want to come away too self-satisfied with, with her arc in a way where I could, I, I could cheer that on. It's like, well, there, there, and in every film, there's always way, things we can reject and receive. And uh, we can redeem, I think, some of these ideas in the film, but that would be a reject. I don't want to hold on to Lori as, as, as a heroic or, or figure that I should be happy or too excited for. <laughs> She's heading into her life as a werewolf. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, eating other human beings uh, not uh, as part of a, a coming-of-age story. <laughs> maybe not ideal <laughs> yeah now um we're, we're christians or if if uh, people haven't realized that already and that's obviously shaped our our perspective on this film and something i i'm some often saying on this channel is that people can take all sorts of approaches to film i mean you can look at film from a historic perspective you can look at it from a psychological perspective you can look at it from a, a cultural perspective and i think they're all valid um but uh, i guess we we look at it from a, a theological perspective, and and so James, you've you've written this book, Cinema Gog, and you're a Christian pastor, and you obviously think there's value in in discussing movies that aren't necessarily made by Christians. Why do you think there's value in in talking about movies from a, a theological perspective? Well, before I maybe in light of the movie we just watched, I'd say before I even talk about what value there may or may not be uh, in the spirit of trick or treat, I. I'd say th there may be a rule or a tradition, and we find it in 1 Corinthians 10.31. It tells the Christian, whatever you eat, whatever you drink, whatever you do, which would include movies to my mind, uh, do it all for the glory of God. So to, to somehow have it be a, a section of my life divorced from theological musing, i.e. things that would bring me to God's glory, like what? It can't just be distraction. There should be some mindful uh, intersection with what I believe. And myself, like many other Christians, weren't, we weren't raised with the idea of applying those lenses or putting those goggles on for that portion of our life. And what's cool is I think it, it's, it's great for personal edification, also great uh, for very organic conversations with other believers about the things that we share, but, but also some very organic conversations with people who don't believe like we do, right? It's a lot easier to strike up a conversation about uh, the latest movie release than in treating your average guy or gal into like, hey, would you join me for some theological debate? Uh, that's usually not at the forefront. Yeah. And, and Paul, Paul models that this in Acts chapter 17 when he, he quotes some pagan poetry. There's your, there's your pagan stuff right there. That, you know, your, your own poets, he, he's looking at pagan poetry and saying, this phrase right here, this, this part, this totally aligns with what God says. And he seemed to be about finding common ground in unconventional places, uh, all altars to unknown gods and, and pointing them then to what uh, you know, scripture being the only thing that he would call out as, as perfect, but then finding nuggets of little t truths in the myths and culture around him and, and using those to sort of point to the greatest story of all. And so I, I think to miss that, that, that's the value there, both personal and commu communal and even evangelical, as it were. I, I think it has uh, some great value on all fronts. I suppose if you're not a Christian and you're watching this, you might be sort of wondering what to think. But sometimes I, I often say is I, I just kind of invite people to sort of try on these spectacles and, and just see what happens when you look at film from this perspective that you've maybe never looked at it from before. Yeah. And loads of sort of patterns begin to emerge. I mean, um, I did a video on the Batman recently and hmm. just... It's almost uh, hard to ignore the biblical imagery of, of the flood and then the fact that Batman leads the people as this kind of Moses figure through the waters with a, a pillar of light. And um, I suppose you could say, well, uh, it's an interesting kind of quirk of, of psychology or, or history that lots of our stories seem to have the same shape to them, perhaps even by accident. Um, so Joe, that was Joseph Campbell's thing, wasn't it, that you talk about in yeah. Cinema Gog, that he, he mapped out all these stories from around the world and down through history and noticed that they had this kind of hero's journey shape. Yeah. And his, his interpretation of that was, well, I guess uh, that there must be something kind of fundamental to humans that wants to tell that story. But he didn't really take it any further than that did he whereas i guess we would say actually these all point to the fact that there is a there is a fundamental story uh, yeah. that we're participating in yeah. and the by yeah the the story revealed in scripture is is the true story hmm. is that is that what you'd say yeah and, and i think that people 
people often, you could just write it off as collective consciousness or a quirk of evolution or, or I mean, I, I spent the first 25 years of my life not really thinking about these stories in these categories. And now I've had the, the blessing of a back half of another, another 25 to sort of work at it differently. And I think for anybody who might try to write things off as just a, a meaningless quirk in a meaningless universe, I, I'd say, first of all, my, my, my heart kind of uh, like hurts for you a little bit. I had another friend who was a total atheist and, and he believed all there was was this life under the sun. But his, his passion, his greatest love, the thing that would get him most excited was Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. And, and so the thing that spoke most to his soul, a, the story of transcendence written by a believer, ultimately he believed that it offered no, no concurrent real hope or application for his own life, right? That all these fictions were just delusions of grandeur of, of us meaningless animals. And I, I dabbled with this in my 20s and was headed towards some bleak, pretty bleak nihilism at one point and, and kind of thought, hey, if life's so meaningless, why, why go on, right? There's some, there's some heavy thoughts that can come from some of that if, you're, if we are not careful. But I think what I, my challenge would be, on the other hand, what makes us so certain? What makes us so certain we came from nothing and we're headed for nothing? I think I realized that I realized that that certainty I had at one point was a mask to get back to our movie even a little bit, right? That's my mask of certainty was a mask I was wearing and not even just to deceive others, but to kind of deceive myself. Because if there was something transcendent, if there was ancient creator or future judge, uh, that that meant my identity and my purpose in my life was defined by something external and transcendent. And I really like wearing the mask that it's meaningless and there's nothing. Well, it means that that's a convenient mask for me to avoid change, right? To, to suppress something maybe I do sense or feel inherently a sort of a story formed sense that we may not, we may not really believe it's an evolutionary quirk. It may, again, maybe it's a mask we're wearing is that, that needs to come down and uh, my encouragement to anybody kind of in that zone would be maybe just don't be so certain just yet. Don't be like Emma at the start of this movie and blow out the candle of possibility so dismissively. Yeah. I think some people would hear that and say, oh, well, but it's just wishful thinking to believe that there is, there is kind of good news. And, but I suppose I would, I would say that I'd love to hear your thoughts as well, that actually the gospel really makes sense of the of the bad as well as as well as the good in that you know in in order to define evil as evil um how as c.s lewis says how can mm. you call a line crooked if there's no such thing as a straight line and so yes it is ultimately this incredible good news story that does uh take us out into into a happy ever after in christ but on the way you know it plums the deepest depths and it really names the reality of mm. evil that i think we all kind of feel uh, i think we all yeah. sense that there is a brokenness to this world uh, perhaps even a brokenness to ourselves yeah. that the human capacity to kind of press the self-destruct button throughout history is remarkable and and christianity actually names that and it's not it's not that good and bad or light and dark are these things that just need to kind of balance out there's actually mm. a sense that light yeah. needs to overcome darkness yeah i mean i think it pulls on a lot of different threads that i i wouldn't say i, I do i do make an argument in the book for kind of a story formed argument for god's existence but i wouldn't think that that would be sufficient for for anyone who's really uh, wondering struggling questioning thinking I think if you, you pair that up with, as you alluded to, kind of the moral argument for God's existence, that there is, there, there is morality, even if we differ on details, there are certain things as humans we seem to think are, are objectively moral good, moral right, moral wrong. Uh, and, and then, of course, there's, there's questions that uh, the teleological argument, that, this, that the universe we're in being so designed that now even we have people like Elon Musk thinking that, that we're all part of a simulation theory experiment and we're, we're just I, I, it's not just a uniquely Christian or even a religious idea to be pondering these things you find them in philosophy and so I to think that it's just the wishful thinking of Christians I'd say no there there are great thinkers throughout all of all, all of hit recorded history that have been struggling with these things and see many viable differences between just thinking uh, came from nothing no meaning and and I, 
it, I feel pretty arrogant presuming to just dismiss all of them. And I think it's, of course, then as I have walked through and grown in some of that, like you, I would say Christianity offers a, a very distinctly unique uh, answer that kind of works like this movie, but you know, deals with a very law keeping kind of relationship with the powers that be above or below uh, this, this world beyond. And most human religion will tell you that's the way to go. And that's really your only hope is to keep it or keep it enough to actually be judged up as being appropriate someday. And that's where Christianity to me uniquely cuts through all of these different ideas and a answers a lot of the things you're talking about and then provides a solution I just haven't found mirrored in just about anything else. And that's, that's that law keeping doesn't save, but that someone has been dispatched to be this, uh, we're not the hero in the hero's journey. And, and he has been supplied, he's come. And that's a unique facet that I would hope people would explore. There's, there's, no, there's no real solution in trick or treat as we just watched, uh, other than maybe keep the laws and hope for the best. And that's where, that's where Christ offers a distinctly unique aspect with, with the application of grace and God's unmerited favor. And it's, it's worth, I hope it's, uh, my encouragement would be anyone, it's worth pondering and exploring. And uh, again, it, it's pretty easy to blow out a candle and just meh, go to sleep, but, but maybe stay awake and, uh, and think a little more on it. Could we touch just briefly on, on horror films? Because mm. horror, I, I think, is a fascinating genre. It's a genre that, that Christians are, are perhaps often rightly cautious about. Um, and I think it's worth saying that this film definitely isn't for everyone. <laughs> um, and I'd never, you know, make anyone watch a, a horror film. Yeah. Um, and there are plenty of horror films that I wouldn't watch. But I'd, what have you found to be maybe specifically the value of, of the horror genre um, in terms of getting into some of these deeper themes, perhaps in a way that other genres don't do or don't do as, as well? Mm. Well, the interesting thing is horror movies rarely, if ever, get it right when it comes to the afterlife, when it comes to uh, religion, when it comes to even even depicting the church or, or, or Christians. It's usually off the mark uh, a considerable number of ways. But what's interesting is if you I did a statistics study, I was reading reading some stuff that had been done years ago. And whereas whereas I think uh, predominantly, at least here in the United States, whereas Eight out of ten people will still say that they're uh, somewhat religious or spiritual, believe that there's more, or, or have some kind of faith uh, at, activity in their life. When you actually, if you watch every sitcom, every movie, you tabulate how many characters or protagonist events any sort of faith uh, in, in their life at all, it's reversed. It's like maybe one or two out of ten. So like, art isn't reflecting life in most genres, comedies, uh, action movies. It's usually characters with with uh, that show no faith, whether it's whether it's Christian, Muslim, whatever. And, and it just seems to be a unspoken agnosticism, which just doesn't reflect reality. You come over into scary films like like these, and you're forced to deal with the idea of afterlife. Uh, what happens when I die? Uh, are there demons? Are there is there a is there judgment? Is there a hell? And while these films never get them right, they're, they're one of the few genres that brokers the conversation at all. And I've had a few people who've either come back to Christ or sought out and gotten saved because they were truly frightened by some of the implications of films like this or The Exorcist or even some, some harsher ones than even this film. And, and they came out the other side. Obviously, that film didn't have the answer. But I think God actually used it to uh, light a little fire under their feet to make them run and find the answers and led them to Christians who who shared the truth of the gospel with them, uh, both both up outside of Christ and in their sins, but then the actual application of the gospel through Christ that not only uh, not only covers your sin, but casts out that fear. Like I, I, like I, can, watch a, I can watch a scary or a horror movie. The film craft might give me a shock, but I don't have to rest in the fear and the questioning and the, and the quandary that comes from it. And so I think about all of the non-Christians out there and, and how they're experiencing this genre. And I think, well, that, there's a place I'd like to meet them and have some conversation. Whereas a lot of other genres of film, they, they're just, they, they don't necessarily dredge up these kinds of 
of thoughts and pondering. And and the horror. And by the way, every genre. The, the genre I fear the most is is kids family entertainment, <laughs> and and Disney. That's, that's yeah. That's where you can sneak in the subtle things, and, and your kid, and you don't even realize some some of what we're allowing. You talk about traditions and our beliefs and other things being undermined uh, as generations go. I I fear the more subtle th- subtle genres and, and the things that we might think are kind of innocuous. This one I think we all know is dealing with some heavy themes and content. So our, our, I think our guards are more naturally up. So. <laughs> Well, that's my two cents. Yeah, and that, and that's something you're always saying on on your podcast, uh, Popcorn Theology, isn't it? In that to to be discerning of everything, and and there's no, you know, we're not mindless consumers, yeah. and and this idea that horror is the one that we really need to be on our guard for, but something like a rom com, you know, Christians can just switch off. Oh. Actually, the rom com have might have a more insidious message than than a horror film in which you know. They yeah. need to overcome the monster and they're saved from the monster or something. <laughs> um, yeah, that's really helpful. Uh, wow. Well, James, you've been uh, so generous with your time. Thanks so much for doing this. If people want to keep up with you and your work, uh, where can they go? Well, the easiest place is YouTube. You can just search for Popcorn Theology, where I'm a regular host, and like and subscribe and keep up with our movie reviews and media content. Very easy. My book, Cinemagogue, which you generously flashed all over uh cinemagogue director's cut the latest edition is available on amazon.com in hardcover paperback or and kindle and you can also find your way to uh there's there's a wealth of written audio and video reviews you can find pretty easily by checking out cinemagogue.com and popcorntheology.com and you can find and follow me on facebook instagram and x just look for cinema guy james harleman Amazing. Well, James, thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much for having me on, Thomas. It's been, uh, it's, it's probably overdue. I should have, I should have asked much earlier and, and uh, been able to jump in and review something. <laughs> I, I'm glad we found a, a perfect and fun film to, to sort of kick it off, though. So thanks again for having me. Oh, thank you. No, I'm glad to, to have had you for this one, given, given how well you know this film <laughs> as well. So. <laughs>